I just want to introduce the next panel, which is on exploring the intersections between innovation and campus sustainability at MIT. Um, and I'm going to invite Glenn Camiso up to the podium. Many of you probably have come across Glenn in your work at MIT. He's currently the Senior Director for Institute Affairs in the Office of the President. Previously, he was the Chief of Staff to the MIT President from 2012 to 2015. And recently, he's managed the Engine Working Group's effort. So he has a lot of experience in the innovation space, and we're excited to have him come up and merge the innovation and sustainability conversations here. Thank you, Susie and, uh, and Julie and the rest of the team for, for having us for this very important discussion. And it's great just to see uh, different parts of the Institute represented here um, to have this conversation. I think it really speaks to um, the need for us to come together to, to have this discussion. Um, the title of our panel, of our session today, is Exploring the Intersection Between Innovation and Campus Sustainability at MIT. Um, so we'll build on some of the comments that have been said already, and we'll really set the stage for, for the discussion through the course of the day. Um, and uh, I'm joined here with a distinguished uh, panel of colleagues from various parts of MIT as well. I think it's an exciting panel. I think uh, this is a, a, a group from different places that I think will provide unique perspectives. Um, Susie mentioned who I am, and I'll take a few moments to introduce uh, my colleagues here. I will be joined by uh, Jim May, uh, who is Senior Project Manager in Campus Planning, and he'll talk about the innovation of our campus. Jim joined the Office of Campus Planning in 2001, though he first arrived at MIT as a freshman in 1978. His focus in OCP has been on early planning for larger uh, uh, renovation and new building projects. One of his first projects was studying the feasibility of expanding the Center for Cancer Research in its then current location in E17 and E19. Ultimately, this study led to the decision to build a new building for the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, and Jim helped manage this project through the design and construction. In recent years, Jim's focus at MIT has shifted from research buildings to residential life. He currently is working on plans for a number of new and renovated student residences. After Jim, Actually, let me show the list here. After Jim, Janine Abenadi, who is the executive director for the MIT Sandbox Initiative, will talk about accelerating innovation at MIT. Janine is executive director of the MIT Sandbox Innovation Fund program. She brings a unique combination of experiences from academic research to senior operational and strategic roles in her startup companies and large businesses. After completing her graduate work, she worked as a research scientist at BBN and is a postdoctoral lecturer at MIT and advised undergraduate and graduate students. She held leadership roles in two of the most successful local Boston area startups, ITA Software and Kayak, where she gained deep knowledge about the travel technology sector. Most recently, she ran a global portfolio of third party uh, products for Travelport, giving her the opportunity to establish partnerships with companies across the globe and to advise and evaluate a number of startups in the travel sector. Finally, Sarah Gallup, a co-director in the Office of Government and Community Relations, will discuss the innovation ecosystem around MIT. Sarah joined the Office of President of the President in 1990. Her role in the Office of Government and Community Relations involves serving as a liaison to the Cambridge government and community, working with citizens, elected officials, businesses, regulatory bodies, and advocacy organizations on projects and issues of mutual interest. Over the years, Sarah has participated on a number, uh, numerous city task forces and committees on local policy matters, including transportation, zoning, land use, personnel searches, and town gown topics. Sarah also represents MIT on the boards of several local nonprofit and civic organizations. You'll hear from our panelists uh, uh, each. We'll each give a few remarks, and then we'll transition into a panel discussion. So I will, before we, we jump into that, I'll just frame um, innovation at MIT, and, and I'll do that by trying to answer these three questions briefly. How is innovation unique at MIT? How is MIT enhancing innovation? And how does innovation connect with sustainability? So um, many would just argue that innovation is what we do here at MIT. This is, this is in the DNA. Um, President Reif often talks about um, MIT is about education, research, and innovation for a better world, to make a better world. And innovation is an integral part of that, um, of that 
we could call it fabric, woven into that fabric. Um, so innovation is clearly an element of the many things that we do here, and, and many of the folks here um, represented um, conduct innovation in those ways. We've seen innovation um, from the very beginning. The, our, our motto, as most of us know, is mind and hand, um, and this, this again um, embodies uh, coming up with ideas and then advancing them to impact. And, and that's, again, what we do here at MIT. Um, and just to give you a little bit of data, because we are MIT, we should have a little bit of data just to kind of think about this. Um, last year, there were over 795 innovation disclosure, invention disclosures, 469 patents filed, 314 patents issued. Over 50% of engineering and science faculty hold at least one MIT patent. Many companies come out of MIT 28 with MIT IP over the last year, 75 total. 30,000 active companies are founded by MIT alumni, generating $2 trillion of revenue per year. So if MIT were a country, it would be the 10th largest country in the world based on GDP. Um, there's, I mentioned, the patents, 70 to 90 patents licensed a year to, to companies. 34% um, of alumni have founded a company. 40% of MIT's founders are serial entrepreneurs. In the last 10 years, we've seen a huge increase in students um, joining uh, venture-backed startups. It, it went from 1.4% to 14.4% last year. So, um, you know, we're, we, we see the growth of this type of innovation happening at MIT every year. This is just a snapshot of, of again, the, the innovation activity here at MIT. We see it in our, we see it in our, um, in our education. This is uh, the 2007 robotics class, students developing a lat, lat, light tracking pet robot. We see it in, in maker spaces. Um, Professor Marty Culpepper, our, our MIT maker czar is, is there. And he's responsible for, for thinking about and cultivating and connecting um, the community with the maker spaces here on our campus. Uh, we see this in, in some of the, the fun that we have, the competitions, um, uh, you know, the 100K competition, for example. This is a, a, a photo of the MIT Hyperloop team, which won a first place in design um, in the SpaceX prize for Hyperloop. And, and, and this is the future of transportation. They designed a, a pod um, that, that basically would go at hyper speeds um, from long distance, I think San Francisco to, to Los Angeles is what they're, they're modeling. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, this is what our students do. And, and, and this is just a photo of, of uh, some of our students on Killian Court in a 2009 class, innovating on ways to carry cargo across, across Killian Court without touching the ground. And they're having a lot of fun. And, and that, again, is, is sort of who we are as a community. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so many programs, and you could go on and on, and we'll hear about some of them today, um, support innovation. Um, the Innovation Initiative, which was launched a few years ago, you know, focuses on connecting some of these programs, developing educational programs, such as the um, Innovation and in Entrepreneurship Minor, um, studying innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and, and we'll hear about the Sandbox Innovation Fund program, later, um, it occurred to me at the beginning of the day that the Office for Sustainability should be on this list. Some of the work that, that they're doing here um, helps to promote uh, innovation here at MIT. Um, and it's also important to mention that it goes beyond our campus. Um, networks, connections, collaborations with accelerators and government and VCs, nonprofits, support services, around here are critical. And we'll hear about some of that as well from, from Sarah's presentation. Um, we're blessed to be able to connect with some of these groups, groups here locally, but also internationally. I love to tell the story of the intersection of Vassar and Maine, which Wired Magazine dubbed as the most innovative intersection in the world. And, and the reason for that is you have the MIT entities such as CSAIL and the Broad and Whitehead connected with companies such as Novartis, and, and there's some uh, uh, support services there. Um, 
and, and a number of other entities in this very vibrant intersection. So it, again, speaks to the importance of, of connections um, for advancing innovation. I'll quickly point out um, some recent activity around how can we enhance innovation here at MIT. So President Reif wrote an op-ed, um, it's now a couple years, focused on the idea of um, bringing hard, tough technology ideas to impact. Um, companies that need patient support, patient capital, need access to specific um, types of equipment. Um, in fact, Professor Kripa Varanasi, who I believe is speaking later today, was featured in this op-ed for his work on the company Liquiglide, and this resulted in the engine. I think most of you are familiar with the engine. It was launched, it was announced back in October. Their CEO was hired a couple months ago in February. They've raised $150 million plus funds, um, and companies are starting to, to come in. These hard technology companies, many of which are sustainable, uh, uh, clean energy, environmental type firms. So I'll close by um, you know, just saying a couple things which I think are obvious to the, to the group in this room. Um, we do, again, innovation every day and we touch it to the work of sustainability. And these are just a couple of examples. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We have folks in this room who could speak more about the work that we do. But these examples include um, the company Transatomic, uh, made by uh, Leslie Dewan and Mark uh, Messi, who are the Massey, who are the founders of this company, and, and they're reimagining the nuclear reactor, um, and, and they were MIT graduates. Um, the work here of the Office of Sustainability, we heard about the Living Lab, and we'll talk about that more. A number of the data initiatives, um, the resilient ecosystems, those type of things um, are, show the innovation in the space. Uh, this is a photo of a uh, uh, water desalination filter, uh, graphene sheets, uh, one atom, atom thick, which precisely controls uh, pores that purify water more efficiently. So this is work that, that comes out of places like the ESI and, and JWAFs. And then finally, um, these are professors Yetming Chang, Angie Belcher, Paula Hammond, who have used genetically modified viruses to increase the power of batteries. And, and this is some of the work connected with the MIT innovation. Initiative, And it's important to mention that innovations tied very closely with science and the funding of science. And that's something which is high on our radar screen right now at the institute level um, and something important for us to think about and remember. So I'll stop there. Um, I'd like to you know, turn it over to our, our panel. And, and the way that we framed it is that you know, we'll talk first about some of the campus innovations here on our campus at MIT talk about the programming and some of the programs we're doing, and then broaden it to the, the ecosystem um, around MIT. So I will now hand it over to Jim, who will talk about the campus. Come up there. OK. Oh, that works, too. Is this going to be? Oh, this is a little bit. OK. So this uh, presentation is adapted from one that I gave at, the, uh, at a sustainability charrette for a new project that we were launching. Uh, it's meant to be aspirational, not a lesson in architectural history. Um, it was aspirational then, and I think if you were there, you, you, know, you may remember that I shed a few tears when I gave it the first time. <laughs> but, um, and it, I, I talk about the proud history of architecture that we have at MIT, and I look specifically at a major paradigm shift that happened at MIT when we moved from the neoclassical of the main group right into the uh, European modernism Bauhaus movement. And I suggest that I think we're, we've been rehearsing for a new paradigm shift. And we're not quite there yet, but I see it on the horizon. So this is, you all know it, it's uh, Building 7. It was the last building that was completed uh, in Bosworth's main group, finished in 1937. It is uh, clearly a, of the neoclassical ilk. It makes no bones about that. In actuality, it's actually a very quite modern-ish building. It has a, a concrete structure. Um, and its organization is very much geared towards 
uh, program, programmatic uses, the interconnected buildings and the transitionless um, intersection between departments. It was all very modern, but yet it clearly has an order imposed upon it in this uh, neoclassical um, details. And, and uh, an example I can point out is that across the top, top of that entablature is a, is a fourth floor with no windows, but it was more important to get those Greek details right than to bring natural light into um, the spaces behind it. This was completed in, two, in 1937. Two years later, we have left that tradition behind us, and we have totally embraced and moved into um, the European modern. I mean, this building could be right out of Dessau. It was so, I mean, this building, it, it doesn't really look much that unusual to us today. But at the time, in 1939, this was a spaceship. This looked like nothing around it or nothing that anyone had ever seen before. It's got, you know, it, it, its forms are very much related to the program. You have the large form of the swimming pool. You have an entrance. You have changing rooms. Um, it, the change was not one of aesthetics. I don't, I, I don't think as much as it was one of technology. Uh, the steel structure allowed these things to happen. Um, I look at that open corner above the entrance where there's no visible structure, and I, to this day, my heart races when I look at that detail. Um, but it, it, um, it really is, it recognizes, I think, that imposing this other agenda, this neoclassical agenda, is wasteful and not necessary. This, this building is meant to serve human beings, and that's really what happened, I think, with that transition. Um, so when we joined this, when we started this transition, we adopted it and never looked back. Um, 10 years later, we built Baker House. And I mean, this literally is a spaceship. If you look at the context of this photograph, it is a spaceship on our campus. And it was like nothing else. It, it's, a, it's a residential, uh, a building for undergraduate students. It had a program of so many beds. Uh, it had a very constrained site. Um, and, and this is the result. And this is MIT, because MIT was, one of the, was really the first place to adopt the modernism to the degree that it did. Other places did not. So 1949, this is what Harvard was building. And Harvard had Gropius, who came from Dessau, who came from the Bauhaus. Um, but MIT, once we made that break, we realized, we knew that we were on the right, the right road. Um, so where are we now? We've been working with this modernism for 70 years. Uh, if you look at our campus, we've taken it many different directions. Um, but I think we've done a better job than almost any of our peer institutions. Um, People look at MIT for its architecture and try to emulate us. But I think we do it because we know it's who we are. And we know that our, our research and our science and our innovation is reflected in our architecture. And it embodies what it is we want to do. And we've been working with it for 70 years. And I said, I think we've been rehearsing for the next paradigm shift but I don't think we've got it. Um, we've, we're, we're getting close, and I'm, um, I have two examples that I wanna show. One is clearly less than aspirational, but one I think helps point us in a direction that um, I see us going. So this is clearly the less than aspirational one. This is actually from an MIT homepage, and I don't know if you can see it, but um, there are, PV arrays on top of these roofs, and the innovation in this company was to disguise them so that you can't see the PV arrays. Um, this is not embracing the new technology, embracing sustainability. This is trying to get past where we used to be, um, and I don't see this as happening. But I think it does point out one thing in that um, a lot of environmental design policy that we have in place actually prevents 
photo array, uh, photovoltaic arrays because they're unsightly. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and creativity in, in the policy sector as well uh, to allow to make sure that, that architecture that is sustainable can happen. This is something I think that is a little bit closer to where I see us going. This is the Bullet Center in Seattle. Uh, it is, it, it, in, it opened as a net zero building, but after the first year of operation, it became net positive energy. It's actually making more energy than it uses. It's a, a simple um, volume with a very uh, favorable ratio of, of envelope to, to volume. The, the, it celebrates its photovoltaic array on the roof. You can see the bus driving by in the foreground. Um, but I don't think it's the most beautiful building I've ever seen. Um, I think that's where the innovation uh, and creativity that we need to bring to the to architecture needs to happen. But I think it's, it's what we need to do, not because we can, not because we want to, but because we must. And that's my talk. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Gina Nabunadi, and I'm the lucky person to be the executive director of this new, brand new program that I'll be telling you about. First, I'd like to really thank Julie for including me in this uh, program, uh, because that's really including students uh, and including student innovators and entrepreneurs in the discussion and uh, making sure that they have a place in the discussion uh, around how they can bring uh, innovation to, uh, uh, to MIT. Uh, so, the program, uh, if uh, you don't know about this program, it's uh, been kind of incredible. It was launched just about a year ago. Uh, I joined in November um, of 2016, and we had a very uh, small launch in January, and we really had a full launch in April. Uh, it was uh, conceived by Dean Waits, and Dean Waits had been working on it for quite some time, and the idea here is to provide more opportunities for students to be part of the, 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 the innovation and entrepreneurship landscape. Um, at the heart of the program, we give money. We give away uh, about, our goal is to give away about $2 million a year. And that's a lot of money. That's, uh, that's the scale of the program is what really makes it work. And we give that money in different chunks. So we give very small amounts at the $1,000 level for students that are just starting out. And then we give all the way up to $25,000 to teams that are ready, that are making progress, that are able to actually put a pitch deck uh, to a substantial funding board. Um, and the idea there is to really expand uh, the, 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 the number of students that are engaged in the entrepreneurship landscape at MIT. So if you ask Dean Waits, he'll say, you know, uh, we'll be very successful if all 11,000 students uh, do the program at some, some point in time. If you ask me and the team that's running the program, I think we will probably faint if all 11,000 uh, 11, students become part of the program. Um, uh, so we work very hard to uh, reach out and make sure that students think that this is a place where they can come to if they have an idea. And the main point is that the idea is their own, they own it. And they, what we do is not only give them the money and the resources, is we connect them to all the people that can help them be successful. Uh, and so on the right-hand side, we, you know, the first part is the easy part. The money part is really the super easy part. Where we spend most of our time on is really putting together a great mentorship program, finding the right people that can um, uh, uh, really guide uh, the, the students, that can connect them within MIT or outside MIT. Um, uh, workshops, MIT is full of workshops, also figuring out how to best educate and so on. Uh, corporate and university partnerships are a big key and I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, and then uh, the other part of it is a lot of what MIT students, especially on that side of the campus, the engineering and science side of the campus, or focus on solving hard problems. So when you go to a classroom, it's filled with equations and they have to prove things and they have to make things. And a part of what we do is actually help them solve a different type of problem. And that different type of problem is figuring out how to take uh, your you know, solution 
and, and bring it to the market. Find the customers, talk to the customers, find the investors, talk to the investors. And those are different types of problems that require a different uh, set of uh, problem solving skills. Since the program started, uh, it has grown tremendously. Uh, we started our first cohort uh, in the summer of 2016. We had about 11, uh, 110 active teams through the fall. We had another 125 active teams. In the spring, we had about 220 active teams. And uh, that, if we look at the number of two students that it touches, it was about 1,200 or 1,300 students. So that's a huge impact uh, here on campus. Uh, in terms of the interest and how it pertains to sustainability, to bring back the conversation to su sustainability, our students primarily are not interested in just making money. If you look at the areas that they're interested in, they're interested in social entrepreneurship, in um, uh, making the world a better place. So we just did the word count here. Uh, smart cities, environment, transportation, energy. These are areas that they're very interested in. And when you talk to them, they're not talking about making money. They're really talking about making the world a better place. Um, so back, so we did a count looking at how many of our projects. So overall, we've seen about four. We've seen about 400 projects. Uh, about 30 of them are totally focused on sustainability. And for them, MIT really could be a very important uh, resource in terms of helping them understand really the problems because that's what they need and maybe helping them um, secure some pilots where they can try out some of their ideas and their solutions. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just put together some uh, high level categories of the, the uh, problems that uh, the projects uh, are interested in. Um, and the problems are in terms of usually uh, transportation, productivity, health, well-being, uh, ocean health, food. Uh, uh, Agri-tech is huge. Uh, alternative sources of energy, the economics of energy, and so on. And the technologies that uh, people are uh, proposing across the board are usual MIT technologies, sensors, smartphones, drones, autonomous vehicles, big data, AI, IoT, and so on. So what's so perfect really about MIT is some of these solutions do require hard technology and do require engineering and science solutions, and that's what's coming through in the proposals. Um, and uh, and uh, really, I think what will be great uh, in this case is to make sure that we have the right connections to everybody that's here on campus and potentially people that are connected to the cities and the state outside of the campus because we have lots of students who are actually trying to, to connect uh, outside of the community uh, and, and help them, help them accelerate and help them get access to those connections um, and so on. That's all. Good morning. Uh, again, I'm Sarah Gallup. I work in government and community relations here at MIT and uh, focus mostly on our relationship with the city of Cambridge and spend a lot of time in Kendall Square. I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation ecosystems and how we uh, measure them. Earlier this year, uh, Israel Ruiz asked a group of us to take a close look at innovation ecosystems and their success factors, focusing primarily in Massachusetts and California. So we did that. Glenn was working with us on that, among other people. And uh, we discovered uh, that there are some very clear factors that uh, bring success to innovation ecosystems. I'm just going to run through them and then tie a few of them to uh, some sustainability topics. So if you want to have a successful innovation ecosystem, you need to have a university or at least some research. And it seems like kind of an obvious thing, but there is something missing, for example, in Seaport. What is it? No university, no research. There's, of course, there's bits of research, but there's no university presence there. And the reason you need university or research presence is because it churns out ideas and it churns out talent, and that's, that's what causes the innovation. Uh, you need a density of industry, and we mean this in two ways. One is that you want to have uh, a mix of industries, so you might have IT or pharma or energy or VC, but the point is that you want a variety of it because that's where you find that cross-fertilization, people sharing ideas. That's why we mix up departments in our buildings. We want uh, people of different uh, 
uh, areas of focus to talk together and problem solve together. The other type of density that we want to see in a successful innovation ecosystem is the size. So you want to have startups, you want to have mid-sized companies, and you want to have mature companies. In Kendall, we've got the startups, we've got the mature companies. It's a little bit tougher to find space for the mid-size, and that's a challenge that Kendall faces. Transportation, I'm not going to say anything, everybody knows. You know, did you, anybody drive home in the rainstorms last week? It's just, it's a real challenge, particularly in Kendall. But in these innovation ecosystems, you got to be able to get your people in and out. And then this fascinating uh, topic around a sense of place, and this was kind of new to us, but a, a successful ecosystem has to feel good. You have to feel like you want to be there, that it's vibrant, that you're welcome there, it's a place for you, that there's a variety of activities. And I was so taken with Julian's remarks, I don't know if he's still here, around spatial justice. I've never heard of that before. I, and it's, I really think that that's what this thing is sort of getting at. Any person from anywhere should be able to be present in an innovation ecosystem and feel that they belong. So those are the primary factors. Then there's a set of secondary factors. Um, if, if we found that if there's an engaged civic association, uh, now I happen to be the president of the Kendall Square Association, but really we found this in our research, <laughs> That it's not just a chamber of commerce or, you know, sort of the typical civic association, but a dedicated association that's trying to advance the ecosystem that brings more success. Key catalysts, whoops, oh, isn't that cool? But I wasn't ready for that. Key, uh, key catalysts play a big role. That could be a university, could be government. Uh, I think, you know, Seaport wouldn't exist if we didn't have the Silver Line or the Third Harbor, Harbor Tunnel. Uh, San Francisco wouldn't be booming right now if the city didn't offer a payroll tax exemption that Twitter decided to take advantage of. You see this all the time. Uh, I think in our view, the Dome is the catalyst in, uh, in Kendall. Community collaborations, this is, this is sort of exactly what Julian was talking about. He's not here, right? He's gone. I just was so intrigued by what he was speaking of, and we really found it in our research. Every single innovation ecosystem around the world has right next to it a lower income, poorer neighborhood that is missing out on opportunities, economic opportunity, educational opportunity. They, they're not able to access the innovation in the knowledge economy. And so we're discovering this, and to be successful, we here in Kendall have to reach out to our, our neighbors. And then finally, sustainable mixed use. We need to build sustainable buildings. We've got to have open space. Um, we got to, we, we want to have water, access to water. So um, sustainable mixed use. So those are the eight factors that um, cause innovation ecosystems to be successful. So how am I doing, Steve? Do you know what he's doing here? He's holding up signs telling you how much time you have left. I love that. All right, so just say, um, whoops, yep, okay, okay. Um, I'll just say a little bit about transportation. There are 50,000 people working in Kendall Square every day. And so all of us, every one of us has to work on this topic, and we are. Um, you, at, in the Kendall Square Association, we have a transportation committee. Some of you are on that. We're trying to really educate our board and ourselves about the transportation challenges that face Kendall and the area, and trying to bring some influence to that dialogue. We have a, the Kendall Square Mobility Task Force is a group of people who have been working together on these same kinds of issues, looking at red line service, bus routes, ped and bike solutions, and other collaborations. Lots of people are focused on pedestrian and bicycle amenities, and the city makes you build bicycle facilities and pedestrian facilities whenever you develop, which is probably a good policy. I know we're gonna be talking about that later. And of course, our own new program, Access MIT, is helping us to reduce our carbon footprint, get more people using alternative modes. So this is a shared challenge and objective that we all have to keep working on. And so these collaborations with the neighborhoods, um, it, you know, we, we see this gap. It's, it's an income gap, it's an opportunity gap. MIT wants to try to address it, so do other uh, entities in Kendall Square. And why do we want to do that? You know, one, because it's the right thing to do. T uh, two, because it promotes diversity in the ecosystem. And, you know, we were hearing before that we should look like the, our communities. 
And three, it leads to sustainable practices. So if we can help our neighbors to gain the skills that they need so that they can access Kendall's innovation economy, we're gonna have more people walking to work and not driving to work. If we can make sure that there's housing here that's affordable, people are gonna be able to live here and they too will be walking to work. So there's this, this very strong connection between supporting our neighborhoods and sustainability that I, I love that Julian was getting at. And I, I hope that we can all learn more about that. And then finally in the category of um, sustainable mixed use, the um, preserving the heritage of old districts, uh, the late urban planner, or sort of urbanist Jane Jacobs, some of you might have heard of her, um, would always say, new ideas like old buildings. There's something about combining our industrial heritage with new technologies that, that accelerates innovation. And so we do see that in the innovation ecosystems around the country. We see it right here in Kendall. Uh, the bottom left slide is looking down Main Street. Those are the three old buildings that we're preserving in our Kendall uh, uh, Square Initiative. And it, it brings a, a diversity of architecture. It contributes to the sense of place. So that's one component of the sustainable mixed use. And then the other is that we're all trying to work together in these ecosystems to share best practices, to promote uh, technologies, to collaborate, explore partnerships. So we have a KSA, Kendall Square Association, Eco District Committee that's actually led by Maureen McCaffrey. And we, uh, a few years ago, signed the Cambridge Compact for a Sustainable Future, which is led by Steve Lanou. And that bottom picture on the right shows uh, Raphael Reif with Drew Faust and the mayor and the manager at the time signing this agreement that many other companies have also signed on to where we're sharing best practices and working together towards sustainability. That's it. Thank you all. How about, how about another round of applause for our panelists? Yeah. So, so we'll now transition to a discussion, a, a conversation. I think you've heard a number of different perspectives around innovation at MIT and the connection with sustainability. Um, so we'd like to have a, a discussion, hear questions from you, but perhaps as you're thinking about those questions, I'll ask a couple um, to just got, get the juices flowing to help us start thinking about uh, this topic. So one of the things I heard in, in most of the presentations was the importance of collaboration and connection, um, both from an external perspective to entities around us. Um, you, you heard about government and, and industry. But I'm also interested on, in internally, we have a lot of talent um, in this room, in this community within MIT. How are we thinking about tapping into that talent to advance the work that we're doing? So I'd love to get your thoughts, both on the external side and maybe the internal side in terms of how we collaborate. Well, I'll start. Um, when I first started practicing architecture in the mid 80s, um, sustainability wasn't even a word that anyone talked about. And even when I started at MIT in 2001, it was something that started to be talked about, but it, it was sort of a, well, you know, an add-on. Well, do you want to do the sustainability thing with this project? You know, here's your checklist. Let's, let's go and see how many points we can get. Now it is fundamentally a part of the entire team. It's MIT is the owner, it's the architects we hire, the engineers that they hire, and it's the contractors we hire. And it starts day one. It is so different than it was 15, 20 years ago. It's just amazing. And it's not, I mean, that's part of us designing a specific project, but it's the city that we work in. I mean, the city has, gone so far in the same direction that we're headed, it's really exciting. It really is, and it's going to happen. And it, the, the pace is gonna pick up. And I'm just so eager to see what the next five and 10 years brings. It's exciting. So I've seen exactly the same thing that Jim's talking about happen um, in our what we call our town-gown relationship, and it really has been these sort of 
last 15 to 20 years where we all kind of operated on our own, you know, companies and developers and MIT and the city sort of do its own thing. And you never see that now. There, there is not a topic that we don't all collaborate on. And we're, we are very aligned with the city. The city's very progressive. MIT is very progressive. But there are still times when I think sometimes the city gets out a little bit ahead of us. And we, you know, and yet we believe in the topic or we believe in the issue. So I, I love the way that MIT reacts to those kinds of dynamics, which is to not come in and say, no, we're not doing this, or we can't do this, or we won't support it. But can we bring our expertise to the table to bring more information to the committee or the task force, whatever it is. So we share information, and we continue to talk. And, and it really is true collaboration. And we find our way. You know, a lot of people say it's tough being in the city of Cambridge. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's definitely challenging. But um, we, we have shown that we can really work anything out and, and uh, come, come up with solutions uh, because we're collaborating. We're MIT. That's yeah. what we do. Yeah. So the perspective I'd like to bring is really the perspective of having these young students with bright ideas that are ready to work on hard problems. Um, and what they need is they need to be connected. And I don't find it's really that easy to do that. So, so the, the mechanism that we have today is this mechanism of having people on the funding board and the people on the mentoring pool, and we have some amazing mentors, and those mentors are connected to the rest of the community, and we rely on those mentors to make the connections for our students in terms of what they need. But I think in terms of the internal connections, we can really think a little bit harder about how to use our mentors from within MIT and have them either serve on review committees that review the ideas or actually really be active mentors, because that's one way we can get these connections that you're all aware of, and that's one way that you can get connected to our students because they are really brilliant and sometimes you sit and you think, okay, this freshman doesn't know much, but they are incredibly bright and they're very creative and, and I think we, we need to just think a little bit harder about how to create these connections uh, so that people are aware of both sides. Actually, to, to build on, on this last point, um, I'm interested in the role of policy. In, in the work that each of you do. Um, I'm involved in the engine working groups um, effort. So uh, what that is, is a group of 60 members of our community who've come together to develop policies and procedures to help MIT be engine ready. I talked about the engine earlier, this accelerator for advancing hard technologies. In fact, Janan is on one of those um, uh, working groups. And um, they've really made a lot of progress in terms of thinking about MIT policy as it impacts um, that type of innovation. I'm curious if the three of you have thoughts, both on the internal MIT side, but also from a governmental perspective, how policy impacts the way the three of you think about innovation in your work. Um, I think we're fortunate that um, we work at MIT, and at least with regard to architecture and architectural design and sustainability, MIT is firmly um, behind us in our, in our efforts. Um, as Sarah suggested, there are always challenges. Um, budgetary challenges exist, as we all know. Um, but I think that Fortunately, from my perspective, I think a lot of the policies are in place, and they help us. I suggested in some of the comments that I made that um, a lot of what we do, in, in our case in the city of Cambridge, um, where a lot of the local design, environmental design policy is in place, zoning ordinances um, and other requirements, they're actually helping us to, to get in the same place with the Article 22 um, energy uh, requirements newly imposed by the city. Um, and I think in our case, if, if we proposed something with a piece of architecture that um, is not 100% in alignment with some of the environmental design policy of the city, they would certainly entertain um, allowing that to go forward if it 
demonstrated um, a sustainable aspect of, of, the, uh, of the design and, and, and something that was in everyone's mutual advantage. Um, it's a rather narrow answer to a very narrow set of policy. I'm not sure it's what you were asking, but that's my perspective. I think city policy really does play a tremendous role. Uh, if we look back at the, the birth of biotech in Kendall Square, you know, we could all say, well, that's MIT. MIT caused that to happen, and maybe Bill Sharp particularly. But it, there was something else that was taking place in the 70s, and that was that the city of Cambridge decided that it was um, a little bit afraid of our DNA research and wondered what that was all about, and did it get in the air, and were we going to breathe it? I, and it's just incredible. If you've ever watched, if, if you ever want to learn more about that, take a moment to watch some of the hearings from back then. It was so interesting. And it was a crazy time, and a lot of our uh, leading researchers and Harvard researchers took the time to try to educate the council. And I think it was onerous and difficult for the community at the time. The result is that Cambridge was the first city to establish policies around our DNA research, and that since it, since people knew what the rules of the game were, they wanted to come and locate here. So there wasn't uncertainty. You'd go to another city, you don't really know what they were going to say about it. But the policy uh, was established, and that in part contributed to the birth of the biotech uh, center here. But the city also has uh, policies around, for example, retail on the first floor. You have to have retail on the first floor. That creates vibrancy. Uh, you have to build 20% uh, if you're building a housing development, 20% has to be dedicated to affordable housing. Uh, that was just recently increased from a lower number. And uh, innovation space. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, and um, so the city requires a certain percentage of housing. It requires retail space. It requires, uh, when you go through a zoning uh, process, a certain percentage of innovation space. And then there's this thing called mitigation. That's what the city calls it. Um, we have other words for it. But, uh, but it's when we develop a project, the city asks us to do all kinds of things, many of them sustainability related, uh, many of them having to do with transportation. So the, I think the city policy uh, influence is, is really uh, significant. So I'll focus on the MIT uh, policy and the MIT programs. And I think uh, uh, what's refreshing to me is that MIT is really willing to look at what's needed and then change the policies in order to make it easier to do things, at least on the, uh, the entrepreneurship side. So a couple of examples were when we started the program, one of the big issues was around IP and the ownership of, of uh, the IP. Uh, for the students that are funded through the Sandbox Innovation Fund. And we worked with the TLO and with the uh, Office of the General Counsel to make sure that any projects that were funded by uh, Sandbox were owned by the students, as long as the work didn't come out of a lab that was already funded through some sponsored research. And that's actually incredibly important. And another feedback to Julie, I had a couple of teams with the Incubation Fund. Uh, and I said, well, why didn't you apply to the Incubation Fund? And they said, well, because there we have to actually have a PI involved and then the IP is kind of complicated, and that's why we prefer to go for a sandbox. That makes a big difference to what students will go for, what type of funding, even though the other funding is a lot more. They'll actually choose less funding as long as they feel they can have ownership over it. Uh, the other example that we're working through, we have a very strong biotech uh, entrepreneurship group, and they're really amazing and trying to figure out whether you can actually start a biotech company as a student without having to uh, be dependent on your PI or your faculty. Uh, and they want to be able to have access to biotech space and with you know finding the right ways to do it uh, so that they can keep ownership. So that's still work that's being done uh, with all the maker space work. And uh, uh, I think the engine is going to help with that as well, uh, being able to get access to that space and find the right terms around that space so that the, the, the students feel they have that ownership. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done. To me, what's refreshing is that MIT through you know, the engine working groups or directly with the uh, general uh, counsel um, uh, is, that, is willing to kind of relook 
at those policies and see what needs to be changed and what can be changed and do it pretty fast. So. Thank you. I often think about the RDNA discussion that the city of Cambridge had 30, 40 years ago. And if those went a different direction, this could be just a very different place. <laughs> no yeah. biotech, no life sciences, and, and who knows what would be here. I'll, I have actually more questions, but I'm gonna pause and, uh, and ask the, the group here if you have questions. Um, yes, Amanda. Thank you. We're very familiar with the term innovation at MIT, and I wonder if we can take Julie's suggestion seriously and make it a little strange, right? So, um, and tie in a little something from, um, from Julian's talk. In what ways are the ways that we're supporting and fostering innovation at MIT engaging with the social equity component of sustainability, right? So we've got lots of examples where the environmental quality component is driving uh, and pulling uh, the science and the technology piece of it. But how about balancing that out with the social equity and the addressing inequality portion? Where are we helping to foster and, and engage that? I can, I can start with one thing and, and love to hear if there are other thoughts. Um, so today also happens to be the day um, that we um, have our first day of the, the SOLVE conference. I don't know if folks are familiar with SOLVE. It's an initiative around pulling folks together externally, internally to talk about some really hard issues. Um, and it starts this evening through another couple more couple days. One of the big efforts within that is this thing called the um, Inclusive Innovation Competition. And, and the purpose is to address exactly what, what Julian was talking and Amanda, what you're alluding to is how can we think about innovation from those perspectives? Are there companies, are there startups, are there ideas that can help move the needle from, from that point of view? So there's, there, it's definitely on the radar that this is an important piece. So, so I, I definitely want to highlight that as, as one of the activities that, that's ongoing to, to do that. But I, I, I also appreciated Julian's presentation. And from the institute level, you know, community is so important to President Reif and, and to the leadership here um, that this has to be uh, one of, as we think about innovation, as we think about the societal impacts, it has to be part of, of the conversation um, here. Any other thoughts? Well, one thing that comes to mind is our CUP, our uh, central utility plant, uh, what do we call it, new century, <laughs> the new cogen plant. And uh, I, I think w with regard to the, the interface between innovation and social justice or whatever phrase we want to use, I, I think we're lucky and fortunate to be in Massachusetts and to be in Cambridge and be at MIT. I mean, if we're not going to put those two things together, I'm not quite sure who is. We're in the right place to do it. So for example, we had to take our cogeneration um, uh, project through a rigorous uh, environmental process. And one of the main themes was around environmental justice that are, because we are right next to so many neighborhoods, uh, Area 4, the Port, and Cambridge Port and East Cambridge, just because we wanted to change our you know, cogeneration plan, we, the state wanted to make sure that nothing that we were doing would make the air quality worse. In fact, it's gonna make the air quality better. But it, it, we spent two years, more than that, making, ensuring that we were, you know, ensuring that environmental justice was being served. So it, it kind of goes back to the policy question. I, I do feel like we're, we have the policy infrastructure to address these kinds of issues, but I think we gotta talk about it more. And that's, what, again, why I love this er earlier talk today. I think it's just gonna be part of our lexicon, you know, every time talking about where the justice is, whether it's environmental or spatial, as I said, that's new to me, or social or, or whatever it is. Hi, my name's, my name's Jason Jay. I'm on the faculty at uh, MIT Sloan. Um, I want to sort of build a little bit on what Amanda was asking and just kind of this notion of what we call innovation and what we call the innovation ecosystem around MIT. Um, a lot of what shows up on these slides and so on is like, and, and, and in the sandbox kind of support system as well, is kind of a venture capital centered notion of what innovation is. And I know that that's not the, 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 the focus of it, but it's a, it's a, it's a, um, exerts a gravitational force, right, on the whole process. Um, and one of the things that, we're, that I've been very conscious of in, in 
over the last couple of years is that um, when you're creating innovations for sustainability, oftentimes what you're doing is you're creating a new kind of organization, right? A, and there's a million different concepts, social enterprise, for benefit company, sustainability oriented enterprise, there's a lot of buzzwords for it. But the thing that we're coming to understand is that for those kinds of companies to thrive, they need a supportive ecosystem. So not just venture capitalists, but impact investors, or pay, you know, people with maybe dual bottom lines or more patient uh, time horizons for their investment. Um, courses, like the like I, I teach a sustainability-oriented innovation and entrepreneurship course. Jeff Shames for undergraduates this fall is gonna start teaching a course on building the social good organization. So there's a whole kind of learning component to it. The legal aspect, having lawyers who actually can advise you on how to create a, a for-benefit company or an L3C or some other legal infrastructure for that. Um, I think if, if we're gonna be serious about building sustainability into the innovation ecosystem, we need to be thinking about what is the organizational form that's gonna emerge out of it such that it can be thinking about the social justice and equity questions and the environmental sustainability questions as well as the economic returns to the founders who of course the students wanna make it big, right? Um, that's, you know, they've got Zuckerberg and others as their heroes and there's a, mul there's a, multi there's a, a multifaceted objective function now. So I'm just wanting to hear from you guys a little bit about how in these discussions about the sandbox and the engine and, and the larger ecosystem, how can we build an innovation ecosystem that's supportive of a more holistic understanding of innovation and, and its outcomes? Question. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, actually an excellent question and the one that's um, uh, maybe one of the challenges we need to, um, uh, to overcome. Uh, if you look at the funding board of the Sandbox Innovation Fund, we've, you know, easy to attract the, you know, kind of traditional investors that are looking for high returns and so on. And what we need to do is make sure we attract people that are on the funding board, on the advisory board, on the mentorship pool, uh, that are, have that other expertise, which is how do you create these self-sustaining uh, organizations and what are the options for, for our students. And that's something we absolutely need to work on um, and, um, you know, happy to meet with you and figure out what the right way to do it is, but it's high on our priority list because a large number of our students is very interested in the social equity uh, problem and they come to us with kind of those problems in mind with the goal of making the lives better of uh, people that are living in poverty or uh, trying to come up with better ways of improving lives all over the world. So I'm happy to have that conversation with you and seek your, you know, help in making that stronger. And I should just quickly mention that the, the genesis of the engine was coming from that place that the existing structures, uh, both from a mentoring expertise perspective and a funding perspective, didn't work for a number of the technologies that we're talking about. So they created this entity called the engine to, to kind of bring creative ways to address those. But what I appreciate is there's even more than just those. There, there, there are, there's the, there's the uh, social impact opportunities that maybe should be woven into the thinking there. So there's even more, I mean, the engine's brand new. So there's, there's I think, opportunities to, to even enhance that. But uh, I, I do appreciate that. And the good news is that I'm, I'm told that we're, Steve is telling me that we have zero minutes left. But the good news is that uh, we now get to transition to a time of discussion where we can talk about some of these issues and the opportunities. Um, so I'd just like to thank, take this moment again to thank the, my fellow panelists, and to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.